So welcome to the 23-24 um, year of uh, the finance here in the town of Waitley, Massachusetts. Um, we have on board at this meeting, we have Dan, Tom, Jim, Patty, Brenda, and Paul. Um, Donna, are you in? Not yet. Okay, she's not. I here. am. I am. You are. I have been. <laughs> oh, you're hiding. Oh, I am. <laughs> okay, here she is. All right. Um, well, welcome. Um, it's great. Um, so we um, we have an agenda, and I think everyone has seen the agenda. And the agenda states uh, we will do an introduction uh, for everybody on the committee, so that we all know each other and um, where we are and where we've come from. Okay, I'll start. My name is Paul Antea. I've lived in this town for almost 40 years. Uh, my background is for the most part in sales and education. Um, I sold for 30 years for uh, a pharmaceutical company called Bayer Healthcare Pharmaceuticals. And prior to that, I taught school at a number of locations in the state of Massachusetts. Um, I live here on Weber Road with my wife, Maureen, who uh, is a retired school teacher from the town of Deer Deerfield. And we raised our three daughters here. And we are currently continue to raising our three daughters and our three grandchildren are here as well, for the most part, which is great. Uh, not that they live here, but it kind of seems like they do. So that's me. Um, why don't we start at the top? Dan, why don't you talk a little bit about yourself? Well, a lifetime resident. Been on the committee longer than I can remember. Uh, my background was uh, 40 years with IBM. I had a group of 12 that I ran for up in Keene, New Hampshire. Then I came back and started working around the house and doing a little carpentry and here I am. All right. And Dan, where do you live? 82, Chester Plain Road. That's okay, very good. Tom, Tommy, go ahead. I'm Tom Mahar. I've been living in Waitley almost 43 years. I live in West Waitley. Uh, I'm a, I guess I'm a semi-retired farmer. The farm is, I've been running this farm for four, almost 43 years and my sons are taking it over now. 28 Poplar Hill Road in West Waitley. And I've been on and off the finance committee for probably 35 years. And this is currently my longest stint, which is probably 25 years now. Well, that's a chunk. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for your service. Jim. I'm Jim Kirkendall. I live at 311 Haydenville Road. I've been in this town about 25 years. Served on the committee for about six years. My educational background is primarily accounting. My practical background is accounting and operations. Retired from Hardig Industries about 11 years ago. Uh, my wife, Karen, is also retired. We have two boys and five grandchildren and enjoying every minute with them in our retirement. Beautiful, thank you. Patty. Hi, I'm Patty Devine. Um, I've lived in Waitley since 94. So coming, you know, 27 years, 28 years. I'm a civil engineer by training. I uh, spent 14 years in design work with USDA. I now work for the Army Corps of Engineers where I am a cost engineer and I do value engineering, which if anybody's curious, I'll explain offline. Um, yeah, I live right next to Amy, actually. <laughs> we lived here first though. <laughs> It'd be great for commuting. <laughs> um, no, I live on, on State Road. Um, yeah, I have two daughters, uh, no grandchildren yet. I don't know. If that, no, that's good, given their age. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, 
been on the finance committee, I think a whopping year, maybe even and less. Do, and doing a great job. Okay, Donna, thank you. I'm Donna, you're next. Okay. <laughs> I mean, Patty, I'm sorry. Donna, you're up. Okay, hi, I'm Donna Wiley. I've lived in Waitley for 13 years. Uh, I retired um, six years ago from a 40 years career in nonprofit administration. Is somebody else, is anybody else getting feedback while I'm talking? A little bit. Okay. Yeah. I don't know where it is. Um, uh, what do I do? Um, I'm on several boards, both of, well, several boards outside Waitley, boards and committees. And in the town, um, I guess what I've done the longest is to be on the historical commission and I chair that now. I am, for the last couple of years, the historical commission's representative to the preservation committee. I've been on some ad hoc things and I saw Dan Kennedy every week for two years <laughs> while we, <laughs> Yeah, we went worked our that. way through the town hall <laughs> project every week for two hours for two years. <laughs> that was a good, actually good work. Very good. And I, sorry, I live um, on Chestnut Plain, a few houses down from the town hall. Very good. Donna, thank you very much. And our newest <laughs> member, Brenda. Okay, so my name is Brenda Doherty. I feel like I've lived in Waitley for about 13 years, but I've only officially lived here for about six months because um, my partner Pete Westover and I have lived in two places for that period of time. Um, I'm from Western Mass. My parents, I'm just going to say this because such a huge part of my story. Um, not that you need to hear my story. My parents love the valley so much. So I, I um, grew up in Longmeadow and I'm a lawyer by training. And I also, you know, after law school, when I moved back to Western Mass, um, drove for four years to BU to get a degree in tax. So I do have some degree of um, ability, I hope, to be on this committee because I feel totally, totally ill prepared to be on this committee. Um, but I was a tax lawyer for 20 years after I moved home, after being a lawyer in Boston for 20 years. And um, I was also just, I'm, I'm, I guess, I feel like I'm trying to justify myself. So I was also the chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals for Springfield for 10 or 12 years. Um, uh, so that's a little bit of my background, but I, I'm, I'm feeling um, very grateful for the opportunity to be on this committee and hope I can just shut up and listen and, um, figure out how I can help in any way. But my background is as a lawyer, a tax lawyer, and then um, yeah, certain other small things. And if I didn't say it already, I live at 170 Long Plain Road in Waitley, uh, where Pete Westover lives. So there you go. Very good. Thank you very much, everybody, for the overviews. Um, let me just uh, obviously welcome everybody to the first meeting and hopefully as we move through the year we'll get some uh, live time because um, I think pretty much everybody gets zoomed out very quickly um, having this kind of a format. Um, as I um, just let me speak to the committee itself as to what we do and we are here um, basically by uh, edict from uh, the state. Um, the uh, state charges all finance committees with the responsibility of creating a budget to be brought before the town at the annual town meeting. So um, that's what we're charged with. Um, in many respects, uh, we are um, the, um, is everybody there? Oh yeah, 
Um, in many respects, uh, we serve as the, um, um, in, as some have said, the voice of reason at times for various expenditures. And um, there are towns and there are cities whose finance committees operate somewhat independently from um, elected officials. We don't do that, okay? We try to work in concert with them and we work um, very closely with Brian Domina and Brian helps us shepherd through the process. Um, and he will alert us to um, things that are occurring within the town, both financially as well as at times anecdotally that will, um, uh, that will serve us to come up with um, the budget that we need to present. Um, so that's what we do. Um, and it's important that we work with the select board um, and we will have joint meetings with the select board. And the reason for that, we just started that a couple of years ago, is that so that um, we all understand what is needed within each department and we all understand um, where each group um, has concerns. Um, and that way it's, it's far more efficient for us as well as them, as well as the department heads. So um, that's what we, we do. And Brian sent out an agenda of uh, dates and times moving forward. Um, and we have that and we will stick to that um, from here on out. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to get to number two here in the agenda. And Brian's point is the com committee reorganization. Um, that is, uh, I don't know if that's a miss, but we'll just leave it at that. The law says, the law says, or the direction from the law says that we should elect a finance committee chairperson every year, as well as a vice chair every year. Over the past few years, I have served as the, as the chairperson, um, and we have not gone through this. We have not gone through the formal votes and um, recommendations and votes and all of that uh, that's, that's tied to it. Now, this is somewhat um, an awkward time to do it because you know, in the past, we, we did it. We wrote names on slips and passed them over to uh, the town administrator. And, and you know, we, we did it that way. Um, so what I'm doing right now is to say um, we look for nominations for individuals to hold a position of chairperson. I'd nominate I nominate you, Paul. I nominate Paul. I'll second that. <laughs> <laughs> Nomination is closed. All those like in to... favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Stuck with it. <laughs> Donna, Donna, and Brenda, don't be scared on on this. This is this is <laughs> this is how things roll. But um, I have I have to say it's nice not being the uh, newest person on the board anymore. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Paul. Just thank a reminder. You, thank you. Just a reminder yep. that any any votes that we take need to be by roll call. Yeah, because we're and still I'm remote. Do that right All now. Right. So, so this is the vote we are taking for. Um, does anybody wish to nominate another individual, or does another individual want to step forward um, to put their name in the hat to do the chair position? Let's vote. Okay, we we'll vote. Don. You have to say my name or the name of the person. Dan? I vote for Paul. And okay, Tom? I vote for Paul and Taya. Jim? I vote for Paul and Taya. Patty? 
I vote for Paul Antea. Donna? I'll vote for Paul Antea. Brenda? Hello, Brenda? Are you there? I think she might have, it might have cut out. Okay, we'll... Um, She's on mute. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, um, before we move forward, we have to have a vice chair of this committee in the event that the chairman is unable to perform their duties for whatever reason, the vice chair person can step in and uh, take over. So do I have nominations for vice chair? I nominate Tommy. Do I have That's a second? Funny, I was gonna nominate Jan uh, you, Jim, but I'll second Tom. <laughs> okay. Thanks. All right. <laughs> Tom, would you accept if elected? Yes. Okay. We will go. We will. Does anyone else nominate any other person or would like to step forward for the position? Okay. We will take a roll call vote. You have to say Tom's name or the person's name you would like to see in that position. Dan. Tom. 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 I Jim vote for Tom Maher. Can't vote for myself. No, you can't. I vote for Tom Maher. Okay, Patty. Tom Maher. Donna. Tom Maher. Brenda. Okay, I'm just going to put it down. And I vote for Tom myself. Okay. All right. So that piece of um, that piece of uh, the agenda is complete, and we will now go to the minutes. Oh. Amy got something to say. Are, are we having any problems with the with the muting and the unmuting and um, no? Brian, Tom, I can see you. Yes. Yep. There he is. Now I can see Brian. <clears throat> is there a, is there any? technical problems with Brenda getting in or Brenda? I can't hear Brenda, no. Okay. She tried to tried to get in, flashed up, but then went out. Yeah. I think she's muted. I can see the mute uh, sign next to her. Could also use the chat if you need to. Okay, okay. Um, has everyone had a chance to review, to read? The minutes from October 18th meeting? Yes. Okay. Do I have a motion? I make a motion we accept the minutes of the October 11th meeting. Do I have a, a second? second? October 18th. October 18th, pardon me. October 18th. Okay. I second. Okay, very good. We have to take a vote. We have to do the roll call this way, Dan. I. Tom? Aye. Jim? Aye. Patty? Aye. Donna? I wasn't at the meeting. I guess I should recuse myself. There you okay. Go. Flat. Brenda would probably be the same, and I would say yes. Um, so we're good. Uh, we're good with that. Okay. Um, now, for... Um, to move on in the um, in the agenda, I mailed out. Now they are <clears throat> everyone, with the exception of uh, Donna and Brenda, uh, when we're not part of this process. So, but um, we're going to discuss this, and it would be very beneficial to everybody um, to get your input on it, um, and. We, I sent out earlier today um, a little overview of the transparent reference spending process and initiative that we began um, on the finance committee um, some time ago. And it's not done by any stretch of the imagination, but we're getting closer. And hey, Paul, did you send it out today or yesterday? I got I an email from out, you. I sent it today. Today. 
Really? Yeah. Yep. Um, what time? Because I, I have one from yesterday at four fifteen. I will keep looking. No, it, that's the one. <laughs> that's the oh, one. okay. Yeah, it says yesterday. It, it okay. Does. On my phone, so. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, that's it. You've got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um. <clears throat> Oh, I think you're muted. I think you're muted. What about now? That's good. Okay. The, uh, the impetus for this is um, to make the dollars, to make the spend, to have all of that be more clear to the taxpayer, to the voter, um, when the time comes. And, and that time is obviously on town floor. To most voters, I would say all of us, when you look at the budget we put together, you take a look at the budget and are you there? Are you there? Hello. You take a look at the budget and you look at mm -hmm. where we are. I think somebody needs to mute. I don't know. Can but we look at the, the numbers presented on town floor as they relate to the prior year's expenditures. And it is not a constant because both of those things continue to move. What doesn't move or what can move, but relative to itself, for instance, the pupils, the number of pupils we have in either school, Yes, that does change, but the dollars per pupil is still a rel very relative number. If we look at the highway, what does it cost us per road mile year after year? Because that doesn't change very much. And with the other segments, with the other departments, police, fire, ambulance, general government, if we look at those costs, based on the cost per resident. Yes, that fluctuates, but it's, re it's more relative again. And the voter can look at that number and internalize it far more than they can when you look at a number that is just on a line item and compared to simply the year before with, with a percentage change. So that was the purpose here. Um, and it's, and if we can get this off the ground and get this type of a, um, um, get this kind of a, um, uh, what do I wanna say? Um, the, the financial, um, the financial constant here and have that on the website for all town residents to see, then I think that's, and I think we feel that that's a benefit because we can look at all of these departments and compare them relative to each other as time goes on. Um, so that's, that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Any, anybody want to um, comment on that or what you think about that? Paul, yes. um, I have, a, I think it's a very interesting approach. I, I have two questions. Um, sure. <laughs> we can't understand you. I have two questions. One yep. is, it's uh, somebody else isn't muted, I think. That's, no, that's, that's somebody's got some background in there. Somebody's in the shop or something. Uh, no. Um, will we have, will it be possible, I understand not immediately, to get any um, comparative data from other small towns? I, I, I mean, I think it's certainly possible, um, but I don't believe that um, we're there yet. Um, for instance, um, if you do comparatives, so we're taking 
essentially what the voter approved at town meeting. And we're taking those numbers and we're put, plugging those numbers into the various departments and referencing those numbers to the standard that we've set here. And that standard is, as we've said, the pupils, the road miles, the number of residents, et cetera. That's, that's, the, compar that's the comparative. Now you would hope, for instance, if we went over to Conway and we took a look at what the highway costs per road mile in Conway might be. Well, that might not, that might not equate because see our guys do have a responsibilities uh, that maybe, that maybe don't equal what happens, what the Conway people have to do um, in terms of road maintenance and road care. So Right now, we got to be cautious as to how we compare our numbers to the numbers from another town. But as we as we um, progress in this, I can see that happening with uh, police, fire, um, ambulance. If, in, in another example, if you take a look at the general government that we have. Now, if you look at the line items under general government, um, we may be more, we, we may have more in there than they do in Conway or in Hadley or in Hatfield. Um, the number of line items under there um, um, is going to vary from one town to another. But I, I think with some, um, with some of these, we will end up doing some comparatives. Yeah, that's a that's a Thank long you. answer to what should have been a short. One. Thank you. That makes uh, sense. Um, and my other question is simply the ambulance costs. Is this before or after insurance reimbursements? That's a great question. I believe before. it's before because it's the number that was approved on town floor. So I, the big, so the big number is the number that came out of the budget that everybody voted for. So and this then, is the this is the gross, not the net, in other words. No. Yes. Yeah. I, Thanks. I did the research on this and I on the ambulance one, I took the South County, our share of South County's budget, what they, you know, what we paid them and divided it by the number of residents in town, and it came up to $65.15. That's what it actually caught now they i assume they've already taken out all the reimbursements because that's what we paid them the town of mm -hmm. Wakey paid them yeah 65 dollars times 1300 and some odd residents i believe the number was we used okay right. thanks okay great um the last um the last um department budget on that list is not a department. It's compensation. And we talked about this because um, as, as, as the payer, the tax, um, the, res, res, the residents in this town that pay taxes and fund all of these budgets, um, we felt that it was important for us to watch to see number of employees over time, as well as total compensation over time from year to year. And I have those numbers. Um, I was give, given those numbers by our accountant, but I haven't plugged them in here yet because um, I'd like to have a I, I, I know we talked about this once, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page in regards to what we plug in for compensation, because we talked about part-timers and we talked about full-timers and, and, and then we talked about just um, compiling everything and having one number uh, for compensation. Um, and that would be salary compensation. Um, 
I believe, I don't think we discuss this as having, including the health and the benefits because we pulled, we pulled the health numbers out and plugged them into the departments based on individuals who, um, who take that insurance coverage. Uh, we don't name, there's no names. We just have numbers. Um, so I want to put that out there for, um, for discussion again as to how you feel about us um, relaying this information, which is, uh, um, you know, ob obviously open to the public, but um, how we re relay this information <coughs> to the residents of Waitley. Anybody have any thoughts on, on that? Do we do full conversation? Do we break it up part-time, full-time? Do we break it up uh, town, school? Do we, or do we just lump them and have one number to move forward? What do you think? Do the numbers change from part-time, full-time, per diem, all that drastically from year to year? I couldn't tell you that. I, I don't believe so. Um, so wouldn't it make sense just to take the lump sum of the salaries and divide it by if we're trying to go per resident? If they yep. don't dramatically change. Um, and they don't. Wouldn't it make sense to just take that number, whatever it is, and divide it by the number of residents and be done? I'm, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. It's much more straightforward, I think. Yeah. Okay. And I think it matches kind of what we're already doing. Right. Okay. So, um, any other comments or thoughts about our compensation um, costs? I I have a question. I thought when I read your note that well, let's take single departments. They're easier: police and fire. Um, does the uh, compensation do those? $156, $46 per resident figures include the cost of compensation to the police and fire department or not? Yes. Yes. Tommy. Oh, good. That's what I thought. Great. Yep. Uh, okay. That's that's our share. The 156 includes our share of their health insurance, their salaries, their whole budget. We they don't, even though their health insurance isn't in their budget, we know how many people were, are getting health insurance in that department or in each department. And we plugged in $8,046 per employee into that budget to get that number. That makes mm -hmm. sense to you? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it does. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, in essence, it's, it's, a more accurate number, you know, um, as if we as tax payers are paying for health benefits for a certain department, it's never together until now. And that way there, <clears throat> we can see what the true costs are. Okay. Um, I am going to um, ask for a vote on um, to, um, in regards to compensation, uh, per, uh, compensation of, um, town employees that we're bringing everything together, all employees, school, town, part-time, full-time, and we're getting one number. Do I have a second on that? Can I, can I say one more thing, Paul? Please do. You're going to use that 321,822 and divide it by each by number of residents, I assume. But we've already taken some of that 821 or uh, 321, 822 and plugged it into these numbers. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. And it's, it's a good point to clarify here. Um, when 
when I have compensation there, um, that should be salary, I, in my mind. Not um, health insurance. Not health insurance. Not benefits in general. I mean, well, no benefits. No. no. Just, Does it include like, you know, workers comp and um, county and, retirement know, taxes and retirement and, and all that? Right now, I don't think we're there. I think we can. Brian, are you there? Always. Okay. <laughs> Um, the background. <laughs> okay. So look, um, I feel in order to, I, I, I feel that that item should just say we should be tracking total salary payout for all employees right across the board, but does not include the benefit packages because in my mind, they are pretty, um, um, they're not standardized. Um, you know, they're based on the individuals and um, I don't know how easy it is to get those numbers. What do you think? Are you asking me? Yes, yep, yep. Um, Salaries, that's, we can get that, that easily. We can get total salaries for um, the schools and non-school employees. Um, I mean, we know, we can get a total number for, um, for retirement for town employees and school employees. Um, we can get a total number for, I mean, we, we can get the total numbers. That's, that's not an issue. That's something that we track. I think it's just a matter of, of how you want to present it. Yeah. Um, well, I think we're all under agreement that we'd, we'd like to present it as a lump sum um, and not get into the breakouts. Um, and we got to redo all this other. No. Can I, can I put some, uh, my two cents in here? Sure. As long Go as ahead. you're really clear about what it represents and say, hey, here's this, this is what it represents. It may not be tied to other things. Or it may include other things. Yeah. Just make it clear. Yeah. Um, I think the easiest way to do it is to present it as a lump sum divided by the number of residents and say, you know, it, it, wordsmith it so that it's clear what it represents. Yeah. Uh, if someone chooses to read into it, that's something we can clear up in the future. But I, I think maybe we might be overthinking or overcomplicating this. We may very well be, because um, yeah. um, we we tend to be good at that. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, so um, so regarding compensation, do you feel that we should include health care and general benefits outside of salary in this in this particular? Um, piece of the budget yeah yes or no or should we just do should we just put it as salaries i would say salaries honestly okay. um you know it, it's, i'm sorry sorry no, uh, Pat, patty's got it okay oh, patty go ahead uh, no i i just i think that if people are really interested in it, they can dig into it. Uh, we're, we're trying to give them the the, the broad brush yeah, the, yeah, the of, of what's being paid out per employee or per taxpayer or per uh, resident of Waitley. I think that if we break it down too minutely, it's going to get unwieldy and actually could, you know, we could make <clears throat> mistakes. Um, it, could, it, it could become more difficult and more concerning than than it would be if we just said, "Here's what we're paying out, and that's how much it is in, per resident." I, I, maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but I would just—I don't know—I I would hate for us to go down a road where mm -hmm. uh, we were trying to, you know, to, to you know, pull out 
sorry, I have horses. I was trying to pull out one piece of straw out of a bale. Um, yeah. So, but, well, that's okay, Jim. What did you have to say about that? Go, right. go ahead. Well, I strongly believe that if we're going to include salaries, it should be called salaries and not compensation. Okay. I agree with you on that. Um, I concede that. So, do people feel comfortable with just, we will just take a look at salaries rather than add to salaries the benefits that we pay out for this category. Rather than say compensation, we just say salary. Salaries. Everybody good with that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it good. works for me. And you're going okay. to present this. You're going to present this as uh, what it costs every taxpayer or individual, or go by the number of residents. Well, I think we'll go by the number of residents. Um, keep that standard, and because uh, if we go by taxpayers, you're going to have people that pay taxes in this town that don't live here. You know, I mean, they own property, but they well, you know, but. Um, um, We've been using residents, so let's stick right. with it. Right. So we're going to change compensation to salary, and um, and we'll leave it at that. And we will. We we already have health care plugged into the other um, other departments here, and uh, for right now, we'll just keep it at salary, and that's it. Okay. And then you're going to redo, and you're going to take salary out of these other numbers that we got already. No, 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 nope. not to. at all. Okay. Um, no, nope. I'm going to leave them all. I'm just that's that's that is the way it is because if you it's take a, a look separate at the front line, here, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, a it's a separate line, and um, and the other thing is that you know, you know people want to know what does it cost us per pupil. To run Frontier Regional High School, and of course, it's 15, 15 grand a head. Um, no, we don't want to have to make people start pulling, start figuring things out beyond that, and that's so it's very simplified as it can be. But again, Paul, I think it needs to be very clear that uh, the compensation or, or the salaries. Yeah, it, 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 it's a separate line item. It's not. Right. You know, this is not mm -hmm. additive. It's right. it's separate. Right. You know, and I, I, I think when we get to the website on this, there will be an explanation as to how each of these costs would derived. And so that if there's any questions as to, you know, how'd you get to 4698 for the fire? Well, here it is in black in black and white. These are the parameters that we looked at. Uh, this is the math that was done to get there. And here is the number. And we'll only have to do that once. So yeah, that'll be that. Okay. All right, good. All right. And quite honestly, it's going to get refined. This is our first pass yeah, at it. At, um, you know, right. as we go through this, it's, it, it, you know, we'll figure out what works and what doesn't. I agree, I agree. So for right now, we can move forward and uh, use these numbers. Okay, um, number four. Number five on our agenda is a municipal finance overview. And I'm gonna turn that over to Mr. Domino. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right, so some of you have seen this, this slideshow, some of you haven't. I added some new slides to keep Keep it you long, you long timers on your toes. Um, but uh, um, any questions you can interrupt or you can ask at the end. Um, so let me share my screen and I'll start talking. Um, there we go. Everybody can see that. Yep. Yes. All right. Perfect. So this is a uh, PowerPoint I like to do at the beginning of each budget season. It just kind of gives us an idea about the current state of the town, where it's been and where the trends are headed. Um, I've also added in some 
um, just some overview materials so that um, for those who need refreshers can have it. And for those folks who are new, maybe it will help and maybe it will confuse you more. No promises, um, but I'm always available for questions. Um, so really at its basic, um, the town's an entity, it provides services to residents. It incurs expenses to do that. Um, some types of services are roads, public safety, schools, libraries, public health, recreation, all those types of things. There's expenses associated with that. So the town needs to take in revenue to do that. Um, so categories of revenue, there's really, uh, there's there's six shown here, but there's I kind of categorize them as four. Um, tax levy on real and personal property. So that's the property tax. The town receives state aid. Um, the town um, gets revenue through local receipts. And I'll talk in detail about these in a second. Um, the town has reserves that it can uh, take money from. The town can borrow money and the town can um, get revenue from other sources like grants. Um, there's different categories of expenses. So operating expenses, that's typically what the finance committee is working on now in terms of the operating budget. There's capital expenses that the town will incur. Uh, there's non-capital expenses and capital expenses we usually define as, I think we look at projects of over $5,000, I think is how we uh, define that. Um, there's state and county charges. Those are those are charges that the town has to pay that are assessed by the state. Um, there's prior there's the possibility that there could be prior year deficits from a fiscal from a prior fiscal year. Um, that doesn't happen too often. One of the one of the ways it could happen, um, municipalities are allowed to deficit spend snow and ice accounts or winter roads accounts. Um, if there's a really bad winter, um, the town's allowed to um, overspend its budget, but it needs to pay that back the next year, obviously. Um, and then there's allowance for abatements and exemptions. And that really means um, really abatements on, on property tax or motor vehicle excise tax. Let's say you pay a motor vehicle excise tax bill and then you sell the car, you can apply for an abatement. Um, same with same with um, uh, your real property taxes. If you if you think your house is overvalued, you can apply for an abatement and that's within the discretion of the assessors. But um, we use that full amount to determine what the tax levy is. So we have to set a certain amount aside to, to cover those reimbursements. Um, so I'm gonna jump into uh, revenue. I'll do uh, talk about revenue and then I'll talk about expenses. Um, so this is a little bit more detail. So really I think there's, I categorize four, four areas of revenue. One is the local tax levy. That's by far our, our largest source of revenue. Um, and that's um, a taxation on real and personal property within the town. State aid, so that's funds that are provided by the state. Um, so there's things like chapter 70 education aid. We get school choice receiving tuition. We get something called unrestricted general government aid, which is called UGA. Um, and these are, the state aid is shown on what's called a cherry sheet. Um, and once we get further into the budget season, we'll get estimates as the, as the state goes through their budget process, the governor will propose a budget, then the House then the Senate, and typically there's a, a reconciliation period. Um, and at some point, usually um, far beyond when we've adopted our budget and had our town meeting, they'll come to you know, a consensus and we'll have what our, what our state aid is gonna be. Local receipts, so it comes from a number of different categories. Uh, motor vehicle excise tax is by far the biggest. There's, um, um, meals tax, there's um, rooms tax, there's fees, fines, um, investment income, those types of things. It's really a, um, a wide variety of, of ways that the town uh, brings in revenue in, in, in mostly smaller amounts. Um, and then there's those, there's all others, things like um, if we take out a res our reserve accounts, um, if we borrow money, if we receive grants. Um, so in terms of revenue, um, let's look at, this is just a comparison of, of our different sources. This is for fiscal year 22. Um, so this is our anticipated revenue by source. So our fiscal year is of course from July 1st to June 30th. So um, the budget that we're adopting now would be for fiscal year 23, which would start June 1st. So we're a little bit past halfway in fiscal year 2022. Um, so we're anticipating uh, 4.48 million from the tax levy. 
and then uh, state aid is 647,000, local receipts 409,000, all other, you know, 584,000 for a total of about $6.1 million in revenue for fiscal year 2022. Um, and I'll just mention that unlike federal government, um, the state needs to, I mean, not the state, we're not the state, uh, municipalities need to adopt a balanced budget. Um, so we have to generate enough revenue for um, to pay for the expenses that we're going to incur. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the tax levy and the tax rate, because those are things that get talked about a lot. Um, so how do you calculate the tax levy? Um, you take our total expenses and you subtract all the total non-property tax revenue. Um, and the calculation below is for FY22. Um, so like I mentioned before, we have to balance, we, some of it are estimates, but we have to show a, a, a balanced budget. So um, that's how we calculate our tax levy. We need to make up the difference between our total expenses and all the other revenue that we anticipate bringing in. So to get the tax rate, um, we take the tax levy that we just calculated above and we uh, divide it by the total assessed value um, and then we times it by a thousand. Um, the total assessed value is, is determined by the Board of Assessors and that typically happens October, November. We really need certification from the D Division of Local Services by um, early December at the latest. So um, there was actually a pretty significant increase um, in fiscal year 22. And I'm throwing out a lot of terms here, so I'm happy to, to talk about them now or after. Um, <coughs> this, was a, this was a five year revaluation year, um, which means we do a town-wide uh, reevaluation of property values. And there was a pretty significant increase. It was about, I think it was about 12 and a half percent increase in total assessed value. So that hey, really Brian, had- this is Patty. Yeah. Is that is that because of the uh, the glut or what or the whatever the run on real estate that happened because of the pandemic? Um, yes, I believe so. I mean, a lot of it had to do with um, uh, comparable home sale value. So when they happened to be doing this, so I think a lot of it was that. I, we, yeah. Uh, Short no, answer: I just, Yes. I, I'm curious. Uh, you know. Because the last two years, prices have skyrocketed. Yeah. Um, yep. Sure. So, you know, I'm glad there's a five year look back. Um, so, yeah, so we'll be paying the price for a couple of years and then hopefully things will level back out again. So, yeah. So, so with, with the increase in the total assessed value, um, it's going to drive the tax rate down, right? Um, so with the tax rate dropped down to thirteen, you know, seventy-one per thousand dollars in assessed value. Um, so the tax rate goes down, but uh, most people's property values increase by about twelve and a half percent on average, right? So it's not necessarily that anybody is paying any less. It's just the, the numbers are just moving. Um, I got to get this chart right. So this is just to, uh, to show the trend in our local tax levy. Um, I got to get this box out of the way. So it was up 3.42% from, uh, 21 to 22. And in, you know, in terms of the, the total tax levy. Um, and I think a lot of that had to do with, uh, you know, the operating budget increased by about 160,000 last year. Um, and I think our other sources of revenue kind of stayed the same. So, um, we're seeing that there, um, but it, it continues to, to go up as, as costs to operate continue to go up. Um, also, I wanted to talk a little bit about proposition two and a half when we start talking about taxes because um, there's a, a, a pretty big misunderstanding about what Prop 2.5 is. Um, so I wanted to talk about it a little bit. So generally speaking, Proposition 2.5, it was a, 
it, it's a law that was adopted and it limits the amount of new tax dollars that a city or town can raise from year to year. Um, oftentimes I hear people say, my taxes can't be raised by more than, you know, two and a half of two and a half percent of what I paid the previous year, but that, that's not really true. Um, what proposition two and a half does it, it is it establishes two types of limits on a municipal on a municipality's levy. Um, first, it sets a levy ceiling, so levy being the tax levy, um, the total amount of money that a town, the amount of money that a tax that a town will raise for a fiscal year. Um, so first, the levy ceiling is um, a community cannot levy more than two and a half percent of the total full and fair cash value of all taxable real and personal property. And it does it, it functions like a ceiling. Um, and second, a community's levy is also constrained in that it can only be increased by a certain amount from year to year. Um, so this is a pretty good graphic, I think, from uh, Division of Local Services. Um, so there's the town's levy, there's a levy limit, and that's the maximum amount that a levy can be in a given year. And there's exceptions to this, we'll talk about those. And then we have the levy ceiling, um, which the town's levy can't um, exceed that. So let's look at wait lease. I think this is, so this is wait lease in fiscal year 2020 uh, for 2022. Um, so how do we know what our levy is, levy limit is? Um, we take last year's levy limit, we add two and a half percent, and we add something called new growth. New growth is, uh, is, is growth in town that's, uh, I'll state it generally, is, is attributed to development. It's not just the Board of Assessors decided to raise the value of ranch houses 5%. It's, it's actual new development. It's, it's new houses, it's additions, it's um, it, it's really attributed to construction or development. It can also increase um, if you were to have a subdivision and you have new parcels created and there's value in those. Um, so you take the two and a half percent of the, the prior levy limit, you add that to um, the levy limit from 21, you add new growth, and then you get uh, what is the levy limit that we have for fiscal year 22. So our tax levy cannot exceed the levy limit absent, um, absent an override or a debt exclusion or a capital outlay expenditure, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, um, currently Ryan, the town, yep. Sorry. I'm sorry, may I, uh, may I ask a question? Yep. Um, you're using residential uh, examples as you explain this to us. Does this limit apply to residential and commercial properties combined, or is it specific to residential properties? Um, it applies to all property within the town. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yep. So currently, the town has no debt exclusions on the books. We don't have any capital expenditure um, exclusions on the books. Um, so this is our straight, um, our straight levy limit, and then. 2F here is our levy ceiling. That's two and a half percent of the total um, total assessed value. So, right now our tax levy. Last year our tax levy was around 4.8 million. I think 4.88. I think for for 22. Um, so we could go up another three million plus in terms of before we would hit our levy ceiling, and then um, we'll talk about excess levy capacity in a, in a second. Um, so in terms of exceeding our levy limit, um, we can adopt, towns can adopt an, what's called an override. Um, and that's, we would, the, the town would pass a budget at, at the annual town meeting um, that would be in excess of the levy limit and it would trigger, um, it would trigger an override vote, which would require a uh, majority approval of um, town residents. So um, it would be a, it typically happens um, at an election after the town meeting and um, that budget, that amount that goes above the levy ceiling would need to be approved um, at an election. 
or by ballot, it's essentially called ballot vote. Um, debt exclusion or capital outlay expenditure, really the same thing. Um, well, kind of the same thing. There's some differences. I just want to mention that an override is permanent. So if you increase, if you increase your levy limit one year, that two and a half percent that you're getting the next year is from that override amount. So that two and a half, that amount that you, um, that override amount happens automatically each year. It's, it's figured into the calculation. Um, a debt exclusion or capital outlay expenditure exclusion. Um, it's the same idea in terms of going over your levy limit and you can actually go over your, um, you can actually go over your levy ceiling here for a debt exclusion or capital outlay expenditure. The difference between these two is one is a debt exclusion, which means you're borrowing and you're paying off, you're paying a certain amount each year. The capital outlay expenditure is typically you're paying a, a large lump sum that year. Um, so this also is, these are two situations where you could also exceed your levy limit um, and in these two, your levy ceiling but these don't become part of um, your ongoing levy limit, next year's levy limit. It, the debt exclusion will expire once the debt goes away and the capital outlay expenditure goes away um, after the year in which it's spent. So um, I probably com confused everybody more. Um, if anybody wants, DLS has a division of local services has a really good primer on prop two and a half. Um, I can send that to anybody if they want to um, email me. Um, so we track. Brian, some, hey yep. Brian, could I just jump in just one second, just for a little clarification? Two slides back, levy limit versus. Uh, okay, uh, no, the one you just yeah, bingo. Um, in many cases, the financial health of a community is kind of viewed as a differential between the limit and the ceiling. Am I right on that or wrong? Um, you don't want your levy limit to be right next to your levy ceiling, for sure. All right. And that in fact has occurred in it towns um, and have here. put them in a tough spot. It, it will, right? So, so you can't override your levy ceiling. So you're, you're, you're really your only option. Um, absent seeking, you know, I think you can possibly seek special legislation to, for help is to reduce costs. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. That's good. Yeah. So your excess levy capacity is, is a measure, um, is one measure of, of, of how the town is doing, right? Um, so excess levy capacity. So this is this is your levy limit minus your the actual tax levy, right? Um, it's the difference between those two. So it, it's how much money you could raise in that fiscal year without needing to go to an override. Um, this, I, I know some municipalities and towns in cities like to look at, I'll go, let me go back for one second. Um, they like to look at the at, at how much their, their budget increases um, and to see if it's less than the new growth plus two and a half, right? Because if you're exceeding new uh, two and a half plus new growth, then your excess levy capacity is gonna start shrinking. Um, and if you, if you, if your increase is under that in terms of your tax levy, then it's, um, then it's going to be, um, it's going to, it's going to grow. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Hold on one sec. Sorry about that. The technical difficulties at another meeting. 
Um, <laughs> all right. So this is our excess levy capacity. It has been growing um, and it continues thing. to grow. What's that? That's a good thing. I, it's a good thing, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I think a lot of this has to do with, with, with our increase in, in total value, <laughs> um, but it, it really has to do with, um, you know, having that, having a lot of new growth is essentially what, what was happening, right? Um, and keeping spending less than two and a half plus yeah. Mm -hmm. Plus that new growth amount. Right. Right. Um, so I think that's a good goal to, to try to keep it under um, when we can. So um, we like this one because it makes Waitley look good, right? Um, this is our total mm -hmm. excess levy capacity in comparison to our neighboring towns. Mm. Um, if you put if you put Deerfield in any chart, we're going to look good, right? Right. And that's what I like to do. I like to look yeah. better than Deerfield. So <laughs> um, excess levy capacity, again, the towns that have really small numbers are really close to um, either needing an override um, or, or, they're, or they need to go for an override um, if they're going to exceed that. So um, it, it makes it difficult um, if, it's, if, if you live in a town that doesn't care to pass overrides. Um, it makes it difficult because your really other option is is to is to cut services or, or, or cut expenses. So um, that's 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 where we are. So I think it's a good spot to be in. Looking good. Um, so local tax levy again. This this fluctuates based on total assessed value, right? Like there's been there's there's a huge drop here. Um, you know, from 2020, we go from 1567 to, to 1371. Um, but we also need to keep in mind that, um, you know, our, our total values have right. increased right. significantly during that time. So it's not, it's not necessarily that, that it's uh, less expensive or, or that it's, it's really attributed to the, that big increase in total assessed value. Um, that's driving that number down. So um, we also look at tax rates of the surrounding communities again. Um, again, all of these, I think all of these went down from 21 to, um, to 22 because I think they're, almost all the towns uh, saw increases in, in their total assessed value. Um, but again, Whateley's one of, one of the lowest um, at field. Hatfield has always been the lowest, and um, Wheatley is, is headed down to meeting them. Um, but again, it, it can kind of be a little bit misleading if you just look at tax rates. Um, what I like to look at, to, to just to look at affordability, um, is something called the average single family tax bill. Um, so this is, this is a measurement that and this is that in data that's provided by DLS um, that looks at what the average single family tax bill would be, right? Um, so it's around, it, it's hovered around, you know, $4,800 for the, since 2019. Um, and in terms of, you know, we like to look at it in terms of our neighbors, again, in terms of, I look at it as affordability, um, you know, lately, I think is in terms of in terms of our neighbors, um, we're lower than most, um, but lower than some. I guess we're the the, the third lowest there. Um, but it just gives a, gives us a sense of, of affordability in, in comparison to our neighbors. Um, but anecdotally, I, I I think it's it's obviously become more expensive to. To live here, probably to live anywhere, but yeah, um, sure. Yeah. So that's it for uh, looking at at tax stuff. Um, the next uh, the next one is state aid, state aid revenue. Um, so this chart is showing total state aid that the town receives. Um, it's interesting because what 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 we'll talk about in in, in a little while is you see these these um, higher higher peaks here. And these actually um, correlate with more school choice, um, school choice receiving money. 
that the town is is unfortunately doesn't seem to be or doesn't seem to be getting. Um, but it stays pretty constant. What these fluctuations are are really our school choice receiving monies that the town has. Um, my opinion, it's still pretty inadequate in terms of for our, for Waitley and for most municipalities. Um, so, so Brian, this yeah. does not include the grants that we've received. It, these are these are formulaic allocations. Correct. Yep. Okay. And these Thank would you. be listed. Yep. These would be listed on on what's called the cherry sheet. Thank you. Yep. Um, so on the cherry sheet is something called UGA or unrestricted general government aid. So this is uh, money without strings, essentially, um, and the town can use it however it wants. And it's typically, at least the current administration tries to tries to tie the increase to the um, to what it projects economic growth to be for the upcoming year. Um, so it's been increasing by that amount. Uh, my one complaint is that they did not increase it from 20 to 21 because there was concern about um, the state budget in terms of how and the, the economic implications of the, of the pandemic. And it turns out that after fiscal year 21, the town had a, uh, the, the state had a close to a, a $5 billion surplus. Um, it would have been nice if, if some of that money was thrown this way in terms of unrestricted general government aid um, because right each year they're it's this year they're adding about 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 they're increasing by about three percent but it's three percent off the 2020 number essentially um, it would have been nice if if that had been increased but right now it's not yeah um, so I, I was shocked when I saw the budget surplus for fiscal year 21 um, after spending months and after he, spending hours and of hearing dire economic forecasts for the Commonwealth. There we have it. Yep. Um, but again, it didn't really, it, it didn't translate into filtering down to the municipality. Um, I feel like I'm just gonna complain about this, but I'm probably going to. State aid, chapter 70 education. This is the amount of money that we receive um, for chapter 78, so that's education. And this is just for the, for the elementary school. Um, so we get, um, they're projecting uh, $267,000. Um, that's about all they're projecting that get. Our, our budget to operate the elementary school is $1.8 million, fiscal year 22. And the state is giving us $267,000. Um, it's not adequate. I don't think it's ever been adequate, um, but it's not something that we're going to solve tonight or here. Um, it's going to take uh, changes at the state level to make that happen. Um, so here is our school choice. Um, Yellow is receiving and gray or blue, depending on what it looks like on your screen, is sending. So we receive school choice money for kids, for students that we accept, and we pay money for Waitley students that go to a different school under the school choice program. Um, historically, a town, this has been a win for the town from a financial standpoint. Um, you can see at, at, at its highest, we, we were receiving around you know $320,000 in school choice revenue, and that was that's really unrestricted money that the schools can use. Um, but you can hey, see Brian, can I ask a quick stupid question? Um, yeah. Is that just the elementary school or is it elementary and, front and frontier that kids that, like I'm looking at these years and my oldest graduated high school in 14 and my youngest graduated in 19. Um, do we get credit for school choice kids that started in Waitley and go to Frontier. Um, what do you mean by what do you mean by credit? Okay, uh, meaning that um, okay, I'm gonna pick on Katie's class, I guess. She yep. had, I think, the highest school choice class up until that point 
which yeah. was um, she graduated Frontier in, in 19. Um, when we look at these numbers, the 281,000 to almost 282,000 yeah. um, for school choice, does that include the kids that initiated out of Waitley? These numbers, Waitley, Ele Waitley Elementary. These numbers are just Waitley Elementary. Okay. Yep. But Frontier will, will, if Frontier has school choice kids, they will get that, you know, that allocation of money. Oh, no, no, the, I, I just didn't district. know yep. if those numbers were just the elementary school or if they actually projected through the high school. Okay. Yep. Just elementary school. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I have a question too. This is very interesting. When we first moved here 13 years ago, this data was in the town's annual report and the school section of the report stopped. It's, it's um, embedded now. You can't see it quite this clearly. The, the opt-outs, are, are they, which is the sending <laughs> category, right? Yeah. Do they include um, children who are homeschooled or go to an independent school, or are they simply children who go to some to a public school outside Waitley? They are for children that go to a public school outside of Waitley. Okay. Like a charter school. No, no charter is different. So oh. a, a public non-charter school. A public non-charter school. Okay. Yep. So, so we don't. Uh, um, I'm very interested in this, and I know this isn't the subject of our meeting. We don't, we don't have easy data of this is the number of school-aged children who live in Waitley. This is the percentage of them who choose to be educated in Waitley as opposed to elsewhere. Um, the school has that data. The school has it. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. When they come here, we can ask them the number of, of school choice out, school choice in, and they can provide that data. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Um, so what's what's troubling it, and I guess to the school's credit, they've been warning us over the past couple uh, budget cycles that they see school choice revenue declining, and it's it's playing out here um, in costs that used to be paid for that they used to pay for out of the school choice fund is now being shifted to the town portion of the budget um, because it needs to come from somewhere. Um, so part of what is happening in, in I, I, I know that it's happening in terms of the mm -hmm. kindergarten. So Whaley Elementary has essentially one, one class per grade. Um, so the, it, the incoming kindergarten class is, is going to be nearly a full class. Um, so there's not empty seats to fill with school choice. Um, so from a financial standpoint, it, it, it's not great um, from a, all right, we have more families in Waitley standpoint, it's probably good. Um, so it's, it, it's a trade-off, right? Um, but it is what it is from a financial standpoint. And, you know, some of these, these aren't round numbers, you know, because the number for school choice is, is 5,000. Um, that's either paid or, or received, depending on which, whether you're receiving or sending district, but, um, when a when when a student with special needs is goes school choice to a different um, to a different school, um, the total cost of the of the education it, it is paid for by the uh, by the sending district. So it's that's why we don't have even numbers here. So, and that will obviously exceed the the five thousand um, per student. Um, so charter school. Um, so the, the, the town has to pay um, charter school tuition for students who elect to go to a charter school. Um, and the town also gets reimbursed. Um, reimbursement is wholly inadequate, um, but that's, that's the landscape that has been set um, by the legislation. Um, charter school reimbursement, I, in my opinion, needs to be higher, um, but I don't get to decide that. So this is this is what we have. Um, yeah, th just if, there is hardly a slide in this deck that's more aggravating than the one right in front of me now. And I think we this was obviously a great example 
of the legislature trying to overturn school unions. And how they did it was to create competition for the schools for which the taxpayer has to pay double. Not only do they have to pay for the seat that was in the public school that is now empty, but they have to pay for that seat over in the charter school again. And this is, this is Massachusetts to the bone. And it is so aggravating. Um, okay, I'm off the soapbox. All right. All right. So that's what we have for uh, S projected for FY22. These are estimates based on cherry sheet projections. These could go up or down, um, but that's what we have so far. Um, local receipts. So this is showing actual local receipts um, from 2013 on. Obviously we don't have a uh, full, we haven't gone through uh, fiscal year 2022 yet. So we don't have an accurate uh, picture of what that is, um, but they've stayed fairly constant since it's since 2019. Um, and I don't expect a, a dramatic shift in, in that this upcoming year. Um, this is a breakdown of local receipts by source. Just quickly showing that motor vehicle excise tax is, is the main source of our local receipts. So everybody should buy new cars because you always get surprised when you get the excise tax bill of the new car compared to your old one. Um, and nobody ever figures that in. So speaking from experience, um, miscellaneous non-recurring revenue um, is the next highest and that can be really any rev any other revenue not shown here that's non-recurring. Typically this amount is from uh, the payment of back taxes from, from pre uh, prior fiscal years. Um, the treasury collector does try to stay on top of that. So um, there are payments and sometimes significant payments that come in um, as miscellaneous non-recurring revenue. Um, you remember we had a discussion, I'm gonna go off on a quick tangent, discussion about solid waste fees about well, two years ago, three years ago, um, when the recycling markets really tanked, um, yep. they've actually come, they've, they've come all the way back where we're actually receiving, I think, $6 a ton, where they're actually paying us. Obviously, mm. we still pay shipping costs, so it's not, it's not yeah. a wash, but um, we don't have to pay to dispose of our recyclables anymore. So that's good. Great. Um, and, yeah. And obviously, Great. yeah, and obviously the, you know, the solid waste committee um, went ahead and did the increase in the in the, the the sticker fee for the transfer station. So we're seeing some some more revenue to cover their costs there. Um, and then all other this is the all the other different um, sources of revenue. Twenty eighteen is the biggest. That's when that's when the the money hit the books for the town hall historic rehab. Um, Yep. So that's revenue. Everybody still awake? Yep. We're here. Yes. <clears throat> All right. Shall we talk about expense trends? Yep. Make well, it we quick. can. All right. So this is showing expenses by source. And this is fiscal year 21 because this is the last full fiscal year that we've had. To the surprise of nobody here, education is 56% of our budget. That's the three schools, right? That's the elementary school, that's Frontier Regional, and that's Franklin Tech. Um, next is general government. Um, I'm sorry, next is, is fixed costs, because that's, so that's health insurance and retirement and all those benefit costs. Um, that's our second biggest category of expenses, followed by general government and highway. And these, this has stayed pretty consistent throughout yeah. um, a number, number, yeah. number of years. And um, for just for Brenda and Donna, when we go through the year, each of these departments, we will bring them in to our meeting and we'll have a discussion about their budget um, during that meeting. And hopefully we get the budget prior to the meeting so that we can look at it. But at least with the schools, there has been, there, there have been times when we've get the budget 
two hours before the meeting. Yeah. So uh, hopefully that doesn't happen this year, but um, but we will be able to ask questions about the individual budgets uh, during the meeting. Thanks, Brian. Okay, yep. thank you, Paul, for that. Okay. I, I don't even know if you guys can hear me, but- Yeah, thank yeah, you. I can. Yes, yeah. okay. No. Great. So, so this, this, this kind of, you know, there's a lot here, but it, it all comes together over time because you're, you're dealing with each of the budgets on an individual basis and as well as the department heads. Um, and just hopefully we get the numbers so that we can take a look at them. Okay, thank you. Again, thank you. So total expenditures. Um, 2012 to 21, um, again, the costs are increasing um, because the cost to operate is increasing in terms of operating expenses and labor costs. Um, total expenditures compared to our neighbors, um, there's not much data for 21, which means that they have not submitted their data to DLS, which Ooh. doesn't help for comparisons, but um, kudos to our crack accounting staff for getting our stuff submitted. Yeah. Um, but I suspect it's going to be very similar to what, what, what 19 and 20 show. Um, wait, we spend the least. Yeah. Sorry, this is Patty. Um, can you go back to the previous slide just for half a second? Yep. Um, you know, it, it actually, to me, looks fairly stable um, with the exception of 2017, but that was probably when we were doing something wonky. Um, I wasn't here. Um, have we verified that this is really just COLA increases? No. Or I heard Tom. <laughs> are, the, are, these, are these cost of living increases, whether they be, um, you know, gas, you know, just raises and stuff like that? I'm just curious more than anything else because this last year as a cost estimator has been absolute hell. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's both. I think it's, we have in, increases in, in labor costs, but we also have increases in operational costs as well. Okay. Um, so I mean, I Cause think honestly, they don't both. look all that wonky to me. Um, but you know, that's just me. So anyways, okay, yeah. thank you. So just uh, again on this slide, a, a, a point of uh, clarification very quickly is in the header up top without enterprise. So that's that enterprises and you may be familiar with this or not, um, but the enterprise fund is a separate fund um, that the town maintains for payment towards certain services. And in, in this case, it's the water department. And the water department in town does not service all residents. It's only residents pretty much that are, that are on the east side of town. Now it's going to include the center of town as well, uh, but it does not include uh, any residents with their own wells. So that's that's why that's not in there. And then then the second one without CPA. Now CPA is the uh, Oh, what text that stand? That's the uh, Community Preservation Act. Community Preservation Act. Thank, thank you. They do not. Um, uh, those are monies that have been set aside from our tax dollars and matched with state, and they typically do not come to the finance committee for expenditures because they are um, they are apart from uh, that process. So just as explanation, enterprise and CPA. Okay. All right, Brian. Thank you. Yeah. So again, total expenditures, Whitley typically spends the less, the, I'm sorry, the less, the least, less isn't even a word that I know of, uh, the least um, out of our neighboring municipalities. Um, and I think it really is what it is. I think the services the town provides are pretty good. Um, and I think it's on par with, with any of the 
any of our neighboring municipalities. So the fact that we spend less to do it, I think is, is pretty good. Yep. Um, this is looking at total education expenditures um, from 2012 to 21. Again, we're seeing increases here. I, I do note that these increases start around 2018 and that, that, that's about when our school choice is starting to uh, dry up. So I think part of this, part of this increase is, I, I think part of what we're seeing is that shift of those costs from uh, the school choice fund to the, the town operating budget. Um, and in, in cost to Franklin Tech and, and um, the really cost of Franklin Tech are dependent on how many kids we send. And so th there's, there's some other variables at play here uh, from year to year, but um, I think that's part of the reason why we're seeing this increase. Um, and unfortunately it seems to be maybe stabilizing, but stabilize, stabilizing at a much lower rate, a uh, much lower amount than previous years. I just like to show this slide to show how much the state provides to us to operate the elementary school. Um, the bottom line is how much the state gives us. And uh, the top line is how much it costs to operate the elementary school. And, and I just wanna say, this does not include, um, this is a comparison of chapter 70 to our overall um, elementary school budget that the town pays. There are other sources of state funding that go directly to the school. This is just showing the town portion versus um, what the state is giving us. Um, you see that the bottom line stays relatively flat and our education costs continue to increase. So it, it's not even increasing at, it, at, a, at any, any rate that's helpful to us. Say, so Brian, um, just um, what, what would be interesting on that slide on that, and I don't think we've ever done this, is let's take a look at a municipality uh, uh, um, on the other side of Worcester that that runs similar to uh, to Waitley. Small, have kind of have our kind of numbers, and see what kind of Chapter seventy eight um, and ends up there. I don't know if that's possible, but uh, um, excuse me. Call from. Okay, I'm fine. Thanks. All right. Total fixed costs. So these are, I mean, they're driven by health insurance and retirement, essentially. Um, in 21, we paid, uh, in 21, we, we budgeted uh, and we spent close to this amount, uh, 434,000 in for health insurance. And this is including, this includes the, the town non-school employees and school employees. Um, and then we paid 198,000 uh, in retirement costs. So that's total fixed costs, um, and that's a sizable portion of, of our budget. Um, this is this is a look at, at debt payment, uh, debt service payments. Um, so right now we have we have three different kinds of debt. One is what we call general fund back debt, and that's what it sounds like. It's it's backed by the town's general revenue. Um, there's also um, there can also be enterprise fund back debt, and that that um, that's what Paul talked about earlier. There's an enterprise. There's a water department enterprise fund. All all revenue from the water department goes into the enterprise fund, and all expenses are paid out of the enterprise fund. Um, so if if the water department is going to borrow, it can borrow against future um, water department revenues, which it actually has done currently, um, at least temporarily, to pay for the um, to pay for the connection to the pumping station that's being constructed uh, to take on the center of town. So currently they have 220,000 in debt. It's actually on a one-year note. Um, so they will hopefully pay that off this year um, with the hookup fees they're going to collect. Um, and we also have 160,000 remaining in what's called CPA back debt. Um, again, we can, we can borrow against future CPA revenue, which the town decided to do to help fund the, the town hall historic rehabilitation project. Um, there's a possibility we may try to pay that off. I think the CPC voted or was going to vote. We, we, we did. Mayno. Yeah, we, we've been saving money and we, we voted to recommend paying the debt down this year. Yeah. So, um, yeah. 
So that will hopefully go off the books. And then what's shown here is um, general fund debt service. Um, so. This is for um, the excavator and the wood chipper. This is the five-year lease purchase agreement for the excavator and the wood chipper. Um, and those were five years, I think, so. a five-year lease purchase agreement. I was, I was, I was hopeful and excited that we we're going to get this down to zero, and then the chipper decided to dip itself, stop working, and then, <clears throat> you know, and then, then we wanted to purchase an excavator. So, yeah, needed, wanted. Um, anyways, it is what it is. Um, yeah. uh, certified free cash. So free cash, it's not free. Um, this number. It's, it's it's essentially the leftovers from from prior fiscal years, right? That's it's either it's money that's been appropriated for for department budgets and unspent. It's um, collections of local receipts beyond what was estimated. Um, those are basically some people like to say that it's over taxation, which I don't think is necessarily no a great uh, label to put on it because I don't think that's really true. Um, certified free cash can also be, you saw that miscellaneous non-recurring revenue previously. Um, so if we collect, um, money from prior fiscal years, um, at the end of the fiscal year, when our books close, all this extra money is <laughs> all of it. Cause there's tons of it, um, is essential is, uh, the books are sent to, to division of local services and we ask them to certify that we have this much in excess money from fiscal year 21. Um, and for 2022, it's um, 619,000, which it's um, it's a little bit less than, than, than 18 and 19. Um, 18 and 19 were a different years. Um, this was when there was, there was a whole tax dispute over um, the, the tax status of, of Covestro. Um, if you remember that and yep. the, a payment was made for, for, it was around, it, it was just over $200,000 and it was put into a, it was put into a separate account to hold until, you know, the dispute got worked out and, um, that money eventually flipped over to free cash that year. So that's why it's about 200,000 plus higher. Um, but I think around 600,000 is probably where we're going to be. Um, so that's what we're working with in uh, 22. I'm starving. Um, so what do we see for 2023? Um, retirement increase from the retirement board will be about 4.4%. Um, it's looking like group health insurance um, will be somewhere in the range of a, probably about a 1% increase. Um, so it's not gonna be huge increases, but they're gonna be increases nonetheless. I think we've been fortunate the past couple of years that we haven't had any um, huge increases here. Um, education, we, we can't forget that I think it was two years ago that at annual town meeting we approved the uh, mm -hmm. one point uh, multi million dollar bond for frontier capital improvement projects, yeah. um, and I'm fairly certain that that first ass capital assessment is going to be coming this year, um, and we have the the one for uh, Franklin Tech as well that's still on the books, um, and really. The other big concern is the continued decrease in school choice revenue. Um, it, it's it's a it's a it was a pot of money that that was really nice to have, um, which is yep. getting smaller, and those costs either need to be whatever costs are funding either need to be cut or we need to find another way to pay for them. To be right. quite honest, so um, the, the town budget seems to be the the fallback there, um, but that we can have more discussions about that when we have folks from the schools in. Um, and then we continue to spend around $200,000 
um, to reduce the tax levy. So that's another decision that, that we need to talk about um, as we look at budgets. Um, in terms of revenue, um, I say this every year, but I'm pretty certain it, uh, I'm pretty certain it, it's gonna happen this year, but we'll see. Um, marijuana tax, marijuana excise tax um, and impact fee payments. We're anticipating that at least one retail location, possibly two will open during fiscal year 23. There are two locations that have received both their local permits, both at the Sugarloaf shops, one in the red building, one in the gray building. Um, both the, the, the company, it's called Tor Verde, um, has a provisional license from the CCC to open that location. I was fortunate enough to go on a tour the other day um, into the business there, and it, they're, they're nearly ready to open um, from a you know, from the, the store, uh, from having their store ready, their location ready. Um, they still need to go through some um, post-provisional license inspections, um, but they're hoping to be open by um, late spring, uh, early summer. And the other, the other uh, establishment is, I think, further behind in the timeline. Um, you'll recall uh, the town, um, at the annual town meeting three or four years ago, adopted the 3% excise tax, 3% local excise tax on marijuana retail sales. Uh, that excise tax is not paid by cultivators, um, but we do receive impact fee payments um, from cultivation establishments. And we have one um, on River Road. It's called Debilitating Medical Conditions Treatment Center. I still think they're gonna make an easy, put together an easier name, call them DMCTC. Um, I believe they actually had their first crop this year. Um, so we're hopeful that, that, that we're finally going to see revenue from that. So, um, so Brian, I, I, sorry, I keep poking in here. That's okay. Um, for future potential growers, yep. what is the impact or the potential impact uh, financially to the town? So for growers, there's a the town's allowed to to ask for a three percent community impact fee, um, and that the town has done that. The town has a pretty standard host community agreement. Three um, percent on what? Um, of their gross sales. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, so these need to be so so the in terms of impact fees, the 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 eligible uses of the money are. are going to be quite constrained, I think, because um, the the spending of the money sh should be related to the impact of the facility and the community. Um, so unlike the, the marijuana excise tax money, which is essentially tax dollars coming in, um, I think there's going to be, you know, much, um, much less. less eligible uses for the, the impact fee money. Um, Brian, some of the established um, retail sites in Northampton and other towns are now petitioning to have um, some of their extra taxes reduced. Uh, I don't remember. If it's, I don't remember if it's the three percent tax or the impact fee. Do you have any sense of what's going to happen about that? I, I don't. Um, it's the impact fee. Um, the argument is that is that these facilities don't have much of an impact on the community beyond right. other similar types of retail establishments or or right. agricultural establishments, and and therefore they they shouldn't be required to pay the fee. Um, there's legislation I think currently pending that would give the um, that would give the CCC um, authority to. Uh, dive into host community agreements to make sure that municipalities aren't asking for more than three percent of the, you know, asking for more than three percent of, of of the gross sales. Um, and then there's some. I, I think obviously the 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 marijuana industry would love to see the community impact fees go away. Um, I'm, I'm pretty certain that the tax won't go away, but I think there's at least a possibility the community impact fee won't be around forever. Um, so we've licensed, 
I just gave the select board an update and I can't remember. I think there was 11, I think we signed 11 host community agreements um, with establishments and many of them have not gotten through the process. They've gotten their, they've gotten the host community, they've received the host community agreement. Um, they've received um, land use approvals from the town, but either when it came to financing or um, the location wasn't what they thought it was um, in, in terms of the, there was a proposal at um, LaSalle's to, to reuse the greenhouses there. And just, I think the aging condition of the greenhouses wasn't, wasn't what the, um, the applicants hoped, it, hoped they were. So um, for a number of reasons, a lot of these haven't, haven't worked out. Um, so hopefully one day we'll see, we'll see money. Um, but I, I anticipate uh, some amount of an impact fee um, in 23, at least from the from DMCTC that has um, that grew this this past this past summer. So, um, so there's also some, and there, there's also an amount of money. So 468 thousand that's come to the town through the. American Reinvestment Plan and Recovery Act. Um, so that's what we call ARPA, right? That's the, it's also called the Coronavirus Local Fiscal Recovery Funds. Um, and that's money that's, um, that the town received directly from the federal government. We have half now and we'll get half next June. Um, I haven't read, the, the final rule just came out on, on, on what the money can be spent for. Um, can be spent on and I need to read it. I guess it's a lot less restrictive than, than what I had, than what we had with the, um, the preliminary rule, but um, we'll just have to see how that, that pans out. Um, under the preliminary rule, it, it, it was a lot more restrictive from what I understand, but that money's there um, and we'll have to figure out how to do that. There's a, there's a C, what we call it the CLFRF because it's easier to say the CL CLFRF committee that's um, meeting and um, trying to uh, sift through ideas as to how the town can uh, hopefully invest that money um, in the town. Um, and this is this is my soapbox moment um, in terms of my general concerns about growth. But each year I'm proven wrong because new growth seems to be healthy. Um, but a lot of what's driven the growth. Um, over the past, I don't know, five to 10 fiscal years has been residential. Um, the Pine Plains, you know, Pine Plains Estates was, you know, created a lot of new housing lots and, and um, new homes. And that led to some increases in, in new growth, which is good for the town. Um, There's some houses that were put up on Dickinson Hill Road, did the same thing. Um, the industrial park here, where we have some of our largest um, well, one of our larger taxpayers is here, um, but this is essentially full here. Um, so the question is, where does the new growth come from? Um, one of the ideas is, is that is that we've been talking about internally is 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 there are there opportunities around exit thirty five uh, for commercial redevelopment? I always that that uh, state road route five ten you know route one sixteen intersection is tremendously busy. Um, there's a significant amount of traffic that comes through there. There's a significant amount of traffic that, that comes up 91 North and 91 South and a significant amount that, that, that gets off exit 35 and goes to, um, Irving, you know, the Irving gas station, whether it's Deerfield or Waitley. Um, and it seems like a good opportunity to, um, have people from out of town come into town and leave money so that, um, could be taxed and that it could go directly to the town. Um, so there's some talk internally about, about how do we plan for some redevelopment opportunities in that area. Um, and then this is the final slide. It's just looking at what our reserves are at as we start this, uh, budget planning process. Um, general stabilization fund is, um, 361,000 capital stabilization is 193,000. Vehicle stabilization is is um, eighty two thousand. You recall um, last annual last budget cycle we 
created the town building stabilization account and we put in $25,000. Um, certified free cash. Um, this is a little bit complicated to talk about eight o'clock at night. Um, but this was our original certification amount. And right now we temporarily have um, 119,000 um, earmarked for the Hurley project that was voted on at the special town meeting. Um, that the, the plan for that is to it, it to be returned. Um, you know, there's an application before the CPA to um, pay the local share of that plus some design costs. And then we also have the park grant uh, that was awarded to the town. So the idea with that, this event, th this, uh, the 107.91, which is the total project cost would, would be returned to free cash, but right now it's earmarked. So we just need to figure out how we want to work around that. We, we so, basically borrowed money from ourselves. Is that what you're saying? We had to. Yeah, one, one condition of the grant, it's a reimbursement grant, is that we needed to show, we needed to appropriate the full, show that we had the full project costs available. Um, okay. Um, so Brian, the stabilization funds are essentially depreciation accounts, right? I mean, you're, you're setting money aside because you know that things are gonna break and you're gonna have to replace them, <laughs> right? Is that? Wow. Yeah. Yes, yeah, essentially, and yeah, it's money we invest, but it's not, <clears throat> you know, it's not, there's not a huge return on it. It's the rainy day funds. Yeah, you know? we, we try not Couldn't to spend it, but it's there if we need it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think the thinking with the vehicle stabilization. So the other part of this is our capital improvement plan, and um, at least in terms of uh, not, I think we talked about non-heavy duty vehicles. Um, to, so, so there's kind of a planned replacement, at least for cruisers and for, um, you know, the vehicles that aren't non, you know, that are not heavy duty. Pick so up. like Keith's pickup truck or um, the chief's vehicle, the fire chief's vehicle shouldn't have to be replaced for a long time. No. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's the idea is that we're, we're, we're saving for those things. Savings accounts. Okay. So great, two great, one great source. If you want to Google municipal data bank, um, it's a great source. Um, you find all sorts of great charts and graphs and anything you want to see about the, any towns, really any towns uh, finances. Okay. That's you it. Done? Nice I job so. again. Thank nice you job. very Thank much. You. Um, there's a lot there. Thank and, you. Uh, I'll send uh, it out too. As an FYI, our meetings, we try to keep our meetings to two hours. I do everything in my power to stop it at eight o'clock. But <laughs> very often I'm overpowered and occasionally we could go to 815. But that's not going to happen this evening because we have seven minutes left. And we are, um, we are at the... Um, Brian, just let me tap into your um, expertise here again, your knowledge. The school appointment for Frontier Regional High School and Whaley Elementary School. They're looking for two people, right? Or, or, or one person? Well, it could be one or two. Okay. So I, um, I had a conversation with the superintendent about trying to get a date on the calendar when I could confirm them to come in. Um, yep. we went back and forth and we still, I still don't have them confirmed. Um, but the, they recommended, or, or this is the ask, I guess, is wondering if there was a finance committee member who would consider being the liaison to the school committees in terms of the budget process, because, yep. you know, they come to see us and they have 15 minutes to give, you know, to, 15 minutes to a half hour to talk about what their finances are. And it doesn't necessarily give us a time to really dive down deep into it or, or, or to be part of the, the process. We get invited to the public hearing. Um, but it, it was just an idea from. Uh, from I Jerry. don't think it's I don't think it's a um, I don't think it's a bad idea. I, I, I think it's a good idea. 
But I also think it's a result of, obviously, they have five schools. They've got a lot of traveling to do, and they go to five schools, and they've got to do the exact same thing over each time. And I understand that that's, you know, a tough road to hoe. But the taxpayers of Waitley have a right to be able to hear from the highest – um, the most expensive budget that they have in town, those people spending those monies. Okay. Um, I would volunteer for Frontier if somebody wants to volunteer for Whitley Elementary. But I don't think this, I don't, I don't think one person should do both. How often does the Whitley Elementary meet? Their budgeting is is probably three meetings and I can't tell you when it is. I just don't know. I'll um, volunteer. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Patty. Okay. All right. Because I think and it's I'll really, go. really important. <laughs> yeah. No, it is. It it absolutely is important. Um okay. Um we got that done. And um the last part is is there anything you would like to see done or approached or uh, answered or come to a close in this coming year regarding finances or anything within the town that's going to touch finances, which is everything. And um, so I'll throw it out there. If anybody has any concerns or questions about what's going on and how are things being approached. Um, Paul, Paul. This is Jim. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, Jim. No, no, Jim, you go ahead. Okay. Um, I've had a question about the town owned properties, uh, DeMaio property, the center school. Uh, I'm specifically interested in the DeMaio property. I, I lost count of how many years it's been sitting there idle when it could be on the tax rolls. And I, I really think that needs to be addressed. Uh, okay. What efforts are in place to, to get these? properties generating revenue. Very good. Um, obviously, um, we can't, Brian, can you answer that? Can you talk to that? Um, in terms of DeMaio, um, it, it really has been a high priority of the select board okay. um, to sell that. Um, Do you know why, I can tell you. Um, I don't, I don't think so. I, I, I don't have a reason why. Um, I know that that currently we put out an RFI for the center school. Um, there's going to be an RFP that's going to go out um, for the future use of the center school, likely in February. Um, so I think the focus has been more on, on the reuse of the center school. Um, I, you know, when you said prior to when we're talking about exit 35 and people getting off the exit and staying in town, it would seem to me that this concern over that property would dovetail into that initiative in some way. Um, so anyway, let's, let's just make sure that we follow up on that um, as we move forward. Are we good? Yeah. All right, um, Donna. Um, well, I guess my question is about process. I, I know that for several years now, um, the finance and the select board have been meeting together, which obviously makes it easier for department heads who don't have to make the same presentation twice. Correct. But this, I, I see only one meeting at the end of that whole process for this committee alone, and right. I, I my question to all of you who've been on the committee for years is, is that enough for this committee to form its own opinions? That's no. a good question. Yes. Just, <laughs> well, just you know why, me, because. <laughs> let me just jump in. We don't vote as a group until that last meeting. So what we do is we take in information and we communicate with, with our select board brethren as to what they think, what we think, what the department head thinks. And then we keep this 
in in the back of our minds and on our notebooks and whatever. And then at that last meeting, we review each department. And at that point, we um, talk between us as to which way we're going to go. Now, is that enough? It has been in the past. Will it be enough this year? We may have to have a second meeting. And I think at some point in the past, we have had two meetings um, by ourselves. So. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Very good. Um, any last thoughts, um, questions before we wrap? Okay. So we have another meeting in two weeks, uh, six to eight o'clock. And uh, just to let you know, the process is that the um, um, the department heads in town send their budgets to Brian. Brian puts the budgets together, develop a calendar with those people to come in. We get the budgets, we take a look at them, and then we discuss with the department heads and the select board there as well, issues revolving, involving those departments and then we proceed from there throughout uh, the calendar. And that's that. Okay. Thank Can you all very much. Can um, I make a request, Brian? Can you put all this stuff together for us like you did last year or at least print it out for us? Yep. Perfect. That, that'd be great. Ready? I'm sorry. Don't we have a meeting in one week, not two weeks? I yep. could be oh, wrong. But Hold on. That's what the schedule said. Yeah, February 1st. Who won? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, the first. Tuesday, the first. Um, I guess you're right. Okay. We'll see you then. Um, the only thing that would stop that meeting, Brian, if you don't get the budgets to do it, right? Yeah, the, the ones, I, I mean, so the purpose of that meeting is to, is to, I don't know they'll have school budgets by then, um, but no. we want to bring them in anyways. Um, they'll be our first look at all the other department budgets and we'll, we can look over them and, and see, you know, who gets an invitation to okay. Okay. come and explain what they're, what they're proposing. So okay. um, I don't, I don't right. think it'll be a particularly lengthy meeting i think we'll we'll, we'll hit the eight o'clock mark i think we'll be less than the eight o'clock mark by a long shot but mm -hmm. um you will help us here's hoping famous <laughs> last words we're gonna Fingers hold you that right <laughs> brian, <laughs> brian said. all brian right said. i'll tell you good job okay thank you everybody thanks everyone have a uh, motion to adjourn we are adjourned second it okay all right Bye. Later on. Bye.